This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Information technology is very important to most businesses. It could range, of course, just from keeping your simple accounting records on computer, where if it goes wrong, you might be losing your receivables ledger, or people could be putting through journals which weren't properly authorised, all the way up to businesses which uh, completely depend on their IT system working well. Uh, for example, uh, airlines really couldn't function without uh, their online booking systems and so on, uh, working 24 hours a day extremely reliably. And more and more retailers, of course, are retailing over the internet. Think of Amazon, how it would uh, get on or did not get on uh, if its IT system failed. To begin our a look at uh, information technology, we'll just go through some of the ways in which the subject has evolved over uh, really sort of about the 1960s. And in the 1960s, this is when really computers first began being used by the very largest uh, companies, first in America, then in Europe. Uh, the topic really was known as data processing, uh, uh, so it was. And data processing, uh, the emphasis was uh, essentially on, on processing lots and lots of data uh, here. So it's kind of 1960s and, and the first sort of applications uh, that it was made for it in business was things like uh, wages and salaries, uh, things like your receivables. So wages, lots and lots of very repetitive but detailed calculations, uh, receivables, printing out the invoices, the statements, uh, the age, receivables, analyses, and so on. Again, lots and lots of very tedious sort of work. Uh, and the uh, use of computers was, was first uh, really made in, in these, what you might call, calculation-intensive areas of a business. And essentially, what was happening there uh, was that we were really just recording transactions, transaction processing systems. Uh, and it wasn't really until, the, I suppose, the 1970s that we got much beyond that and the, the name kind of changed in here somewhere. There were transaction processing systems, but, but people realized, for example, once you put your uh, receivables, debits and credits uh, onto the computer, there's a very short step there to do all sorts of analyses on your receivables, uh, like aged receivables analysis, like uh, uh, analyzing who your best customers were and uh, uh, so on being able to uh, say this person is above their credit limit now, we will not issue them with any more goods. So the, the, the transaction processing system kind of developed uh, from just debits and credits into debits and credits, plus all the other information you could get from the system. Management information system is really kind of 1970s. Uh, and this was uh, primarily uh, to do with what you would call structured decision. And a structured decision uh, or a structured calculation is one where there is a correct answer, a correct way of doing it. Uh, so should we uh, say yes to this person's order? Uh, it's a very kind of cut and dried answer. You say yes if it keeps them below their credit limit, you say no if it puts them above their credit limit. Uh, so that's relatively easy. Uh, you can have decisions in there, should we order more inventory? And you say yes if it's below the reorder level, and you say no if it's above the reorder level. So cut, dried, sometimes called programmable decisions, these structured decisions. And then really, I suppose, in the 1980s, we began having decision support systems. And the early 1980s was really when the first uh, desktop computers uh, became available. And at around the same time, spreadsheets were invented. Uh, many of you will find it hard to believe a universe where spreadsheet programs were not uh, in existence. Uh, but they didn't really come into about 1981-82. Uh, and immediately what people could then do is, of course, uh, put uh, financial models on the computer. They would uh, have their sales coming in and then, you know, maybe 40% of the sales, you, you, your purchases and, and so on, all your expenses. And, and then you could say, well, the sales in January don't come into February or March and you would get a cash flow forecast coming out of it. But the great thing was, and then you could kind of fiddle about with your assumptions very, very quickly. 
You could change your assumptions about the sales in January, February, March. You could change your assumptions about the gross profit or how quickly you got the cash. And of course, on, on the spreadsheet, it all just kind of flickers through and you get new answers coming out. And the submission support systems means what it says. It helps people, helps managers make decisions, supports them. It doesn't make the decisions themselves. Uh, and a great, uh, and essentially these are what you might call unstructured. So you ask somebody, what is the right way to produce next year's budget? There isn't really a definitive right way. Uh, uh, because it, it ultimately depends on certain assumptions you were making and, and how you get those assumptions, what 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 other maybe economic forecasts you look at, how do you take into account what competitors are doing. Or if you're launching a new product, you say, what is the proper selling price? Uh, there is no absolutely guaranteed way of getting to a proper selling price. But spreadsheets, financial models, this sort of thing, allowed managers to quickly play about, if you like, with their assumptions and numbers and hopefully home in on a set of assumptions which was viable. Executive support systems really first began uh, being talked about, I suppose, in the 1990s. It means what it says is giving support to executives uh, here. The particular characteristics of these uh, was a lot of uh, access to outside information, Uh, a lot of uh, use of estimates. So the executives at the top of the, the tree, so to speak, have to be thinking, you know, should I open an America? So the sort of information they need is to try to, to, to find out, well, what's the market like there? What are the typical selling prices? Who are my competitors in, in this new market and so on? Uh, and then a lot of estimates coming in. Executive support systems are often also regarded as being fairly graphical. You can tell quite a lot from looking at a graph, a bit the way it, it kind of goes up or goes down, uh, and you see the trends very, very quickly, which are maybe not as easy to see if you're looking at the, the figures. Expert systems, uh, expert systems, a uh, bit of a damp squib, really. I suppose they really came in around the 1990s, or people thought they they would. Uh, expert systems, the idea that you could extract from an expert the decision-making process that the expert would make. It was first really tried on things like uh, medicine, uh, where you go in, you've got a tummy ache, uh, and instead of explaining to your doctor and saying yes, no, yes, no, there would be a machine which would say, kind of, you know, which side of your stomach is it? Uh, does it hurt after eating, does it hurt when you're lying down, is it all the time, what what sort of pain is it, and, and so on. You try and extract this kind of diagnostic routine that a doctor would use and put it into a computer. It works okay if you have pretty much cut and dried decisions, and to some extent medical diagnoses, although, although they, they do rely ultimately in judgment, there, there is quite a lot of what you might call structured decision making does it hurt on the right side or the left side? Is it after eating or before eating? Is it before? Uh, 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 is it all the time or is it as you go to bed and so on? And depending on these answers, you are deflected to other answers. People had hopes of maybe turning expert systems into very unstructured decision makers, like trying to predict what the exchange rate might do or to predict what a share price is going to do. Uh, but there hasn't been much success there. Uh, the trouble is there are so many external factors that you have to take into account that keeping the expert system up to date uh, with all of these very often surprising and unexpected factors uh, coming in uh, is extremely difficult. Uh, so let's say that, uh, let's say in New York, uh, for example, uh, there was a serious outbreak of, let's say, Ebola. So it's not been there before, but you can uh, imagine how maybe the uh, the, the, the share prices on the uh, Wall Street uh, would be affected in some way if a, a serious epidemic hit New York, but quite how you would know how to adjust your expert system uh, to account for that is extremely difficult. Uh, human experts may not know, uh, but uh, at, at least they can kind of make decisions pretty quickly. Expert systems tend to have been relegated then into complicated but programmable decisions. 
like maybe working out what pension someone is entitled to, which is quite complicated. Depends when you started, you know, what your salary is, how long you've been there, when you're going to retire, uh, maybe how many dependents you have. There could be all sorts of factors uh, to get the right answer about pensions or social security benefits. Uh, but essentially, each each decision is is kind of right or wrong, yes or no, and this can guide you through these complex decision-making processes. Databases, uh, databases. Uh, intuitively, we know that a database is a large collection of data. Uh, the the great thing about a database is really you hold the data once, but there are many users. So uh, traditionally, you might have had a, a salaries file, you might have had a personnel file kept by two different departments. Uh, and the salaries people would use their salary information for salaries, the personnel information would be used by the personnel uh, people. But of course, quite often that information was, was in common. They probably both of the addresses, uh, they both well, would almost certainly have your salary there and so on. Uh, and there's a, a problem with that because if you were to change address then you have to make sure you update the address equally everywhere uh, and maybe for a short while people see two different addresses or two different salaries until it's all put up to date. The idea of a database is this great big uh, depository really of data that many people can dip into and see what they need but they're all really making, making use in maybe a selective way but of the same data. So, so it cuts down a lot of the risks uh, a lot that the, that the data doesn't begin to get into different versions of it and, uh, and so on. Uh, it uh, also uh, uh, it tends to be if all your data is in one place you can look after it very, very carefully. But of course on the other side the the value of this, this depository of data is great uh, and you must set up all sorts of protection uh, and so on so you don't lose it. The risk of losing database data, if it happens, uh, the consequence of that is going to be very severe. Data warehouses and data mining we'll get on to later when we look at big data. Internet, intranet, extranet I think we know about. Uh, internet used a lot. We can spy if you like on what your competitors are doing. Uh, you can see if you really have got the lowest price or whether you have to give your customers a discount. Intranets, uh, internal internets, a uh, much more efficient way of uh, spreading internal sort of information. Again, everyone sees the same data. Uh, if you're updating the staff manual, you're not relying on somebody taking out one page, putting in another page. Everyone sees the same. And an extranet is where your internet is connected to someone else, I'm when your intranet is connected to someone else's system. So now, for example, it is possible for suppliers of supermarkets to watch their product in the supermarket and they see their product on the supermarket shelves going down and it allows that supplier to anticipate when they need to dispatch new orders rather than waiting on an order coming from the supermarket. So these can be very, very uh, useful in streamlining uh, uh, all sorts of transactions. Enterprise uh, resource planning is where you try to tie everything going on in the organization together. Uh, so you tie together sales orders coming in to the inventory. You are going to schedule production. You can tie this all in then to cash flow forecasts uh, and, uh, and so on, all in one big system. Finally on the screen, knowledge management. So we've gone from data processing to information technology and now we're on knowledge. Uh, and knowledge uh, is sometimes described as the information in somebody's head. Uh, and, and really that's only, the only place really information becomes particularly useful to a business when somebody thinks about it and maybe uses it creatively. There are two sorts of knowledge. There is explicit uh, and this is basically already kind of captured or written down. Not necessarily written down on paper, but certainly is written down on maybe computer records, but basically you know you have it. 
the tacit knowledge, sometimes described as knowledge you don't know you have it. Uh, so we'll say this is not, not properly captured. And the danger is that this is uh, kept in a very kind of informal way in people's heads. It could be like the knowledge a salesperson has about what a particular customer is thinking of ordering maybe in two or three months. They've had these conversations. Uh, we've kind of primed the customer that maybe they will want to order this in three months, but the salesperson never really writes it down. Now that salesperson leaves, then of course they leave no trace whatsoever of this potential order. Uh, and it, it does represent a, a potential huge loss of resources to a company if they don't handle their knowledge management properly and don't seek to capture that knowledge and record it and then allow lots of people to share and use it. Now, what are the, uh, the risks to IT systems and we have operational risks have also got at the bottom maybe something which is more to do with strategic risks as well uh, here uh, and we'll just go down and think of some of the things that could could happen so we have physical risks so it could be something as simple as somebody kind of spilling a cup of coffee uh, over the file server where you're keeping your receivables ledger so you've lost that it could be fire it could be flood it could be you know, knocking the computer off the desk or anything of that sort. Uh, it could be accidental, it could be malicious. Uh, companies are very wary about this. Uh, I can remember, you know, in the 1970s, maybe in the 1980s, but more than 1970s, companies were very proud of their IT systems. It was almost PR saying, look, aren't we a modern company? We've got a great big shiny computer. Uh, and you, you would see this uh, as you walked along the, the road, main road in London, big plate glass windows, and immediately behind that, they had their computers. Of course, great big computers with flashing lights, all looking terribly scientific and modern, because they wanted to advertise to their uh, customers and uh, people walking along uh, their great modernity. Now, you won't see that nowadays. Uh, people tend to hide away their computers, often behind locked doors, uh, to uh, protect them from any sort of physical damage, whether accidental or uh, uh, malicious in some way, or a terrorist act, or, or, or just someone trying to get their own back at you. The main defence against physical damage is going to be some sort of physical restraint. You know, lock your file server away in a machine. Uh, forbid people from taking coffee near it, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, have some sort of fire detection uh, system. Uh, ideally, maybe instead of spraying water on the machine, you can uh, put in an inert gas, which is going to uh, reduce the fire, but without actually destroying the machinery. We then got risks uh, of data uh, and uh, the data and the system's integrity here. How do you know the data that you're using in the system is correct? And of course it might have been introduced incorrectly, human error. It might have been changed deliberately uh, so that someone uh, wipes out records or someone that uh, puts through uh, false amounts uh, maybe to their payroll or something or writes off a debt or, or just wipes the file really. Uh, so that we have to look at. We have to look at espionage. Uh, as more and more uh, companies keep their uh, design information on computer-aided design packages, it's all the diagrams of the machinery are held on the computer, then if a rival can get access to that design information, uh, of course they can suck an awful lot of really competitively useful information uh, out of the, the company. And industrial action, if your computer operators maybe go on strike, uh, then uh, the system not going to work very well, it falls into disrepair, etc, etc. But the more data you are, have in your machine that you're relying on, then of course the greater the risk uh, that something's going to go wrong with that and the consequence of it going wrong could be very high indeed. There are fraud risks. 
the great thing about manual systems is usually if you to change something, it's got your handwriting on it, uh, or uh, somebody looks at it manually and says, gosh, what a large salary this person's on. This doesn't look right. Uh, if you change a salary on a computer, uh, very often there mightn't be much of an audit trail as to who changed it. Uh, and then it just keeps kind of churning out this outrageously high salary for a few months uh, and nobody really notices because it's all done automatically. Uh, fraud risk can be greatly uh, reduced by, uh, say, having passwords, sign-on information, uh, so that uh, you prevent uh, unauthorised people getting access. And if authorised people do get access, then you can trace back any change, any transaction, to the person who put it through. The internet uh, raises a whole extra set of risks. Viruses can get in. Uh, they can hijack your address book, send out emails to your customers, which irritates the customers. They can simply wipe or scramble the data. Uh, uh, they can now, there's a, a new sort of threat, which is called ransomware. The virus it gets in, it essentially scrambles the data, encrypts the data, and then you get an email saying your data is encrypted, you know, pay us a million dollars, and we'll give you the password to unencrypt it. Hacking is the illegal access uh, to computer records. Sometimes it's just poking around to see what's there. Uh, sometimes you might change the record, uh, maybe to give yourself a, a higher credit limit. Uh, sometimes it might be to do much more damage to actually destroy a lot of records. What you need uh, for that is a firewall. What you need for the virus, of course, is a virus checker. And you also need procedures which say you're not allowed to download programs onto your computer, you're not allowed to put in USB sticks and so on unless they've been scanned and all that kind of stuff. Denial of service. Uh, denial of service uh, is where uh, very often a kind of pressure group, but maybe sometimes governments, uh, send lots and lots and lots of simultaneous requests to a website, and the website becomes overwhelmed by these thousands of accesses, uh, and it simply fails. And then it denies service, denies access to legitimate users of the internet. And then finally, illegal downloads. People who, for example, download, uh, let's say, a pornographic uh, material of some sort. It could be uh, illegally, illegally downloading software that you haven't paid for, isn't licensed. It could, of course, be illegally downloading uh, songs or films, uh, again, that you haven't paid for. And of course, there are many very obscure, dodgy sites uh, which will allow you to illegally download that sort of software. It will be regarded by SEMA as being completely unethical, of course, to download uh, uh, songs or films or software without paying the proper license fee. Uh, data protection. Data protection is there to protect people against really infringement of the privacy. Uh, and there are in many countries, there are data protection laws uh, which say what data you can keep, how long you can keep it for, uh, whether people can see it and correct it and so on. And if you don't comply with these laws, then there can be really quite hefty fines. Basically, it's a compliance risk. Inappropriate systems. By this, I mean uh, really that the system doesn't work very well or you haven't uh, updated it and it's got out of date. It doesn't do what employees or customers want it to do. It's maybe got left behind. And this is, a, or it's not useful, and this is essentially a strategic risk. This is a longer term risk that, that we are based on old technology that nobody really wants to use. And it can even be old technology which isn't properly supported anymore by the computer manufacturers. It said, certainly until recently, many of the UK clearing banks uh, are relying certainly on the systems which deal with checks clearing through. This was kind of invented around the 1970s uh, and it maybe hasn't been properly updated or it's a bit of a bit of a house of cards. It's been updated many times 
uh, but because it's been updated many times no one is maybe absolutely sure how it works and there's always the risk that if you put through a small update uh, that the whole thing's come crashing down uh, and about two years ago I think it was the Bank Royal Bank of Scotland put through a routine update to its software and no one could access their accounts nobody could get money out of uh, automatic uh, uh, teller machines uh, for about a week and then there are system development risks risks essentially that we develop the wrong uh, uh, new software uh, and that we do implement it very well we'll be seeing what's called a systems development life cycle now the controls which you have over a computer system has fall into two sorts you've got general controls and you have got what's called application controls I think of the general controls as controls which kind of uh, look over or look after the whole computer installation really it's not unique to a particular piece of software so this is the policies and procedures that really relate to the computer environment uh, and it's things like data center and network uh, operations so network operations uh, how do we allocate sign-ons to people uh, how do we make sure people have got the right access levels and so on uh, how do we maybe physically safeguard the large data center where all of our information is being held system software acquisition its change in its maintenance how do we make sure that we buy the right software how do we make sure it's a value for money how do we make sure it's going to work right uh, how do we uh, make sure it's going to do what people require it to do uh, and, and then if we change uh, or, or try to update software how do we know it's being updated properly uh, for example uh, if, if you think uh, somebody's changing software they, let's say the, the VAT the sales tax you know, is supposed to change from say 0.2 uh, maybe up to 0.21 uh, and maybe what the programmer does instead of changing 0.2 to 0.21 makes a typo and puts in 0.021 so instead of sales tax being raised at 21% is raised to 2.1% uh, all your customers will be paying less but the tax authorities will expect 21 percent and that could be extremely serious it's important to realize that if there's going to be a fraud it can just as easily be uh, uh, the playing over uh, the fraud can just as easily be uh, perpetrated uh, by changing a program as by changing data so if, for example, I, I was uh, going to do a fraud by changing my salary, I, I could, I could you know, take my salary on the salary file and I could increase it, let's say, by 10%. So let's say instead of somebody being paid $20,000 a year, they change their salary record and now they're going to be paid $22,000 a year. That's, it, that's uh, attacking data, that's changing data. But that's the first place I would look, really. If something was going wrong what would happen if in your salaries program uh, I would uh, as a program I would put in uh, his employee equal uh, oh let's put in a number one two three four let's, let's, say, let's say that's my employee number there if the answer no nothing happens but if the answer yes comes out then I say something like salary equals salary times you know one point one, or indeed salary equals salary times ten. So that's a change in the coding. That's a change in the program. Uh, the salary is still twenty thousand. Everybody's salary is processed absolutely normally until it gets to me with my employee number one two three four goes out to the side. Uh, and it boosts my salary by whatever amount I've been chosen. So uh, improper change or maintenance of software is extremely dangerous. And I would say if you're going to do a fraud, this way is better uh, because it's going to be quite hard maybe to track down thousands of lines of computer code and you're looking at one line which has been slightly altered. 
we need uh, proper uh, system acquisition development and maintenance. Uh, uh, we're going to be ordering new stuff. We want to make sure we get, uh, say, hardware that's compatible. Uh, we need to make sure that we get a decent price. We need to put into, uh, uh, you know, we need to set up maintenance contracts. If we're really relying on the software and hardware, maybe we need it to be fixed always within an hour. We need a maintenance contract that maybe does that. If it's not so time critical, maybe we're happy to let it go a couple of days before it gets fixed. Access security, I've kind of mentioned here, physical security, uh, but also access, uh, of course, to uh, records and to systems. And one of the, the key things here, of course, is a password. Uh, but they have to be properly maintained. Uh, I've seen passwords uh, written on a post-it note and stuck on the computer screen. Uh, quite often people keep copies of the password in the top drawer of their desk or they, uh, the password is the name of a cat or something of that sort or it's one, two, three, four. All of that's pretty useless. Passwords need to be something that are going to be hard to guess. Uh, maybe they should be changed every six months as well. They certainly shouldn't be written down. Some companies tell you your password, uh, but generally speaking, that's a very complicated series of numbers and letters and uppercase and lowercase and so on. And it's important, impossible really to remember till you write it down, which kind of defeats the object. And then disaster recovery. Let's say there's a huge fire at your computer installation uh, and it seems to mean that you can't really carry on trading because you have no information there. Uh, disaster recovery is very important. It tends to mean that you, you need a kind of a backup system. So if your main system, let's say it was in London, you might have a kind of parallel backup system mirroring all the transactions. You might have that in Manchester, somewhere physically away from the main system. Uh, and then if something happens, a London system, a fire or something of that sort, you can kind of switch seamlessly over to the backup system. We'll see uh, a number of uh, issues in disaster recovery, uh, really to give confidence also to customers and staff uh, that you'll be able to continue trading. So here we have the uh, uh, the expansion really of this disaster planning or disaster recovery. First of all, you want to minimize the physical risks, lock it away. Uh, don't put it in the basement where water is likely maybe to flood into it and so on there. Have good access controls, you know, keys, retina, um, inspection, whatever way it's going to be. We need the standby procedures, we need the standby machines, we need recovery procedures, personnel management. We need to say who's responsible for what, because it's going to be, you know, if it's a fire, it's going to be a bit of panic. Uh, so we need to go through almost rehearsals of this. Who is responsible for what parts of the operation? Uh, there'll be risk assessment, uh, so we cover the main risks. We uh, protect ourselves against the, you know, the main problems that are going to uh, arise. So we would say, yes, there is a chance there's a fire in a London office, but presumably there's a chance of a fire in the London office and the Manchester area where there's backup, but that's going to be probably pretty low. So I don't think we need a kind of third uh, office, maybe based in Dublin or something of, of that sort. Uh, but there may be some uh, companies where they see IT and continued uh, ability to access good IT is so critical to them that maybe they've got two backup systems. You have to prioritize. Uh, uh, do we need everything working immediately? And probably not. So if you are taking airline bookings on the internet, uh, it's important to, to let people know whether it's a seat in a certain flight or not. Uh, but you might uh, uh, be able to wait uh, a couple of days before maybe you bring live again the bit of your internet system which offers them car hire. That's not quite as critical. We can catch up on that later. Backups and standby arrangements, keeping copies of the data somewhere uh, uh, remote. Standby arrangements we kind of talked to, uh, talked about here. At one point, I was uh, uh, part of a software 
that company. And our backups were very important. Not only did the computer hold information about who owed us money and, and the financial statements, uh, but the computer system actually held what we were selling. We were making software and this was stored on the computer and it was absolutely essential that we had good backups. And what happened, really, the way we did it, relatively small company, uh, the person in charge of the, the network, uh, they would do a backup every evening, overnight, onto, actually it was a tape then, then in the morning they would put that tape into their briefcase and they'd take it home. And always at home this person had five previous copies, each day going back, uh, and they would just be recycled, and then once a month one of those tapes would be taken out and it would be held permanently. So in fact if we had to you could go back and back and back and back and back uh, until you found a copy of the software uh, or the data that had not been corrupted. Uh, Sony recently got into some problems uh, with a hacker. Not quite clear uh, who is responsible uh, uh, for that. Uh, but uh, quite a lot of damage was done there. I mean, people really didn't know what they'd sold. You know, films had sold, TV companies and so on. A lot of very vital information went missing. A lot of emails were exposed, which were a bit embarrassing. Uh, but when they went back to their backup, I think they found that was uh, probably corrupt as well. They had to go back a little while uh, and then to kind of work forward as best you can to try to recreate uh, a, a, an up-to-date but uncorrupted copy of the data. You need communications with staff and PR. So communications with staff, they'll be worried about their jobs. Uh, they'll need to know, you know which office to turn up to and what they're going to be doing and so on. And public relations is important. Uh, your customers will be worried. Your suppliers will be worried if there's a disaster. And we don't want them taking preemptive action uh, and kind of opening you know, going somewhere else to, to get their uh, materials, you have to reassure them that you'll be up and running normally within, say, a day. Business continuity planning uh, can be having a almost like a, a, a an empty office available uh, that you can move stuff into, skeleton stuff at any rate, and to carry on. Hardware duplication is really part of the, uh, the business here of having parallel systems somewhere remote uh, that you can then rely on. Other controls, uh, or a list of other controls that we've got um, uh, here. Access controls we've kind of talked about. Uh, it can be physical, a lock, an ordinary lock on the door, passwords, maybe a keypad to get in by. Uh, many of you may have phones now, or indeed uh, laptop computers or iPads or something, which have got fingerprint recognition. Some systems have got uh, iris or retina. Uh, recognition uh, as well. And then we're getting on to these uh, to sorts of control, these input controls, and these uh, tend to be other sorts of controls. We had general controls which we've been talking about. This tends to be application controls. I will just uh, talk mainly here about uh, input controls because if wrong data gets into the computer, it then tends to be acted upon kind of automatically and lots of damage can be done very quickly so it's quite important that we get input and uh, uh, probably controlled and we're going to be looking really at completeness we want it to be accurate and you also if you can you want it to be authorized now let's get rid of the authorized first how do we know if somebody's putting through, let's say, a salary amendment, that the salary amendment is proper. How do we know it's not just somebody, in a way, putting through their own? Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of the authorization actually comes from kind of passwords or kind of sign on information. If you have a, a particular user name and you get into log on to the system with that username using a password, then the system can give different levels of uh, uh, responsibility, if you like, or authority uh, to people with, with the, the different usernames. Uh, and so all you have to do is to say, right, if somebody is going to be given access to the salaries program to change a salary, it must be 
this person uh, with that log on because that person is head of personnel. Another way that authorization works is actually old fashioned signing stuff, you know. Uh, so somebody's salary has changed, you'd expect probably to see some sort of authorization document signed by human resources, signed by the person's manager, whatever it is, as agreement of their salary. That's kind of got you know authorization out of the way, passwords and signing stuff, really. We'll concentrate now on completeness and accuracy uh, here. And first of all, we have range tests. Let's say you were putting in clock cards for a week. Uh, you might say that anyone who puts in a clock card, the hours must be less than 60. And people might work 20 hours over time, but really if they're working more than that, it's probably going to be a misprint, something wrong with it. Or if you're putting in months of the year, it can be 1 to 12. Anything outside that is wrong. Dependency checks. We've probably all experienced this. Uh, I imagine most of you have tried booking a hotel or booking a flight and you mess it up very slightly uh, and you manage to put in the return flight before the outward flight. There's nothing wrong with either dates on its own uh, but it, it'll come back to you and say this is invalid you know, because you're, you're coming back before you're leaving uh, and it can't possibly be right. A format check, something that happens in uh, credit cards a lot. The big number across the middle of a credit uh, card has got 16 digits. And it can be very quickly ensured uh, that the 16 digits are there. There's only 15, there's something wrong with it. Check digits. Uh, check digits, uh, specially constructed uh, digits, uh, code numbers really. It could be personnel, it could be partner numbers, it could be customer numbers, it could be supplier numbers in there. Uh, and so that they behave really in a certain way. Uh, so let's say that we put in a customer account number. A 3211, customer account number 3211. But of course, sometimes people misprint this, maybe put in you know, 3122 or 3212 or something of this sort here. And a very simple, and it wouldn't be used in practice, but just to give you the essence of a check digit, is all account numbers, part numbers, personnel numbers. Uh, if they're going to work, they should be evenly maybe divisible by 13. So when you put in the 3211, uh, the machine does this little division, comes out with 247 uh, and remainder 0. So basically, this is a number which is, as I say, specially constructed to conform with certain mathematical uh, routines. It's more complicated than that in practice. Uh, VAT at one stage used to have uh, complicated numbers. It depended on, I think, dividing by 41. I think it may have changed now and so on. But the chances of you managing to type in a proper number, uh, kind of accidentally, if you know what I mean, uh, one which happened to, or an improper number which happened to comply with this little test is very small. Sequence tests. Uh, sequence tests is really the uh, first one which is going to help us with uh, uh, completeness. Range test is really looking at accuracy. This is really looking at accuracy. Format is accuracy. Check digit is accuracy. And none of them will really detect if you've left out a, a record, left, left out a transaction. But a sequence check will uh, easiest example, checks in the checkbook are sequentially pre-numbered. You're updating your accounting system for payments by check. It asks you for the check number. Uh, it can easily detect whether or not you've put in that check before. So it's an error. Uh, and at the end of the month, it can print out all the checks in a particular range which haven't been uh, posted. So there's presumably one missing. So this will do completeness. Matching uh, is primarily uh, going to be completeness. Uh, a good example of uh, matching would be you expect every person in the factory every week to put in a clock card or a timesheet. 
So you've got a list of uh, your employees here. You've got your clock cards coming in. They match here. And of course, you've got one which isn't matched here. Some employee hasn't put in a timesheet. Or indeed, somebody might try putting in two for some reason, but it's going to mismatch. Another example uh, would be that you uh, have, let's say, sales orders. You expect sales orders ultimately through dispatches and invoices to be matched to an invoice. So it's kind of proof that we have completed the sales transaction. If you match invoices to the original sales order, uh, and then you can go through the file and you look for sales orders which haven't been matched yet with invoices, then you begin to worry, have we not dispatched these goods? And if not, we're losing a sale. Or even worse, we have dispatched the goods, but we haven't invoiced. So we're giving goods away free, uh, which is not normally a commercial uh, activity. And now that we have control totals, uh, let's say you're going to be putting in three invoices. You really need a kind of batch coming in here. So our three invoices, let's say this one is 100, this one is for 50, and this is for 70. You go through your invoices, add them up, and you know that the control total, or the batch total, for what follows is going to be 220. Uh, so you can submit 220, kind of telling the machine this is what's going to be following. And the machine will add these up again, uh, and if somebody has you know, mistyped to put in, let's say, 160, it's not going to work, and the batch will be rejected. This can do completeness plus accuracy. The range tests, the dependency tests, the format checks, and the check digits are known as edit checks. We're, we're, we're looking almost like an editor would look for almost misprints in the data. We need backup controls. We need to make sure that uh, backups are regularly taken. We need to know the date and so on there. Uh, we need controls against uh, theft and fraud. Uh, and, and again, a lot of the access controls is going to work on, on that one. Uh, another way that will work, uh, maybe to deal with theft and fraud through a computer system, is you have uh, what's called a control log or a run log. So this is basically like a diary saying, you know, on, let's say, the, the 9th of May at uh, 17.30 in the evening, uh, we did some backup. And I will tell you, you know, who did it. Mr. X did it. Uh, and then maybe on the 10th of May, we did various other types of routines. Maybe Mr. Y did that. But then maybe on the 11th of May at 0 to 15, that's 2.15 in the morning, uh, somebody did a journal. So you kind of look through this log here and you say, right, that's normal, backup's normal, uh, this is normal bit of processing by the normal person, but why on earth was this employee in at 2.15 doing some journaling? I mean, we've all heard of insomnia or suffered from it, but it seems to be a curious way of um, trying to cure it. Uh, and your suspicions would be that this person has kind of sneaked in when no one else is there uh, to up to some no good, writing off bad debts, uh, transferring goods to him or herself, whatever it's, it's going to be. Controls of the internet, again, we've kind of looked at those. Uh, viruses, remember, if you're connected to the internet, it is connected to you. You need virus controls, you need uh, uh, firewalls uh, to stop hackers getting in. And then systems development controls. How do we know that we're going to be developing the right system, uh, which is going to be doing what uh, we want and doing what is useful to us? Systems development controls are really uh, seen, uh, I think, in the systems development life cycle. Uh, so what you have uh, to do in the systems development life cycle uh, is to, really to make sure that the software we develop or indeed buy is kind of fit for purpose. Quite often the tasks are devolved to a steering committee uh, uh, from the board, although there will probably be board involvement. That starts with a feasibility study. We need to do a quick bit of investigation 
uh, for example, to look at the costs versus the benefits. Uh, there's no point in undertaking a system if it's going to cost a million and the benefits are only going to be 200,000. Uh, we have to look also at technical feasibility. Will the system work? Uh, and uh, very often our government in the UK embarks on projects which turn out to be technically not working very well and have to be abandoned. Uh, there is operational feasibility. Think of that, is it handy to use? Does it make life easier uh, for us? Does it do what we want it to do? And the final one is social feasibility. Uh, for example, will your customers actually want to use the internet uh, rather than coming in to seeing you or preferring to talk to you on the phone and, and so on. So this is, if you like, a preliminary look uh, here. It, it may take some days to do, quite obviously. It requires some investigation about what's going on here. Uh, but you need to do this preliminary look just to see uh, and to make sure we're not throwing away good money. Because once we get past this here, we're going to be spending quite a bit of money. And it goes investigation, analysis, design. These are the first three steps. Investigation is really looking at what have you got there already? Because what you've got there already tends to at least tell you the most important information flows. You're trading with this information already. Uh, and usually whatever happens at the end of the system development life cycle, you'll still be using that information, uh, maybe enhanced with other information or maybe obtained in a different way. So you have to understand what really makes the company function, what it, almost what its purpose is, what information flows it, 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 it really kind of depending on. And then you analyze, where's the information coming from? Uh, how is it processed? Where does it go to? Really understand the information flows uh, and really understand what might make the system function better. Having investigated and analysed what's going on, then there is designing the new system. We have to do, make sure the new system provides information to people that they need, that the right stuff comes up on the screen. Uh, you need to look at the, the files that are going to be held. Do we need to keep somebody's date of birth? Do we need to keep uh, the date they joined the company? Uh, do we need to keep, for example, how many dependents they have? All of this needs to be essentially designed. The processing, how are we going to do the processing? How often are we going to do the processing? Is it every month? Is it going to be real-time processing? And so on. And security, very important to build security into the system from the start. Just bolting it on at the end is probably not going to work very well. And then we have got systems implementation. We've designed the system, you write the software, and writing software from scratch is, tends to be very expensive. It's highly skilled people sitting down, spending time writing software, and you don't get an awful lot of software written in a year by one person, so it's quite expensive. You must test it to see if it works. You don't want to launch software uh, which doesn't work or which frustrates your customers, which alienates your customers in some way. You have to convert the files from the old, perhaps manual system to the new computer system. Uh, and maybe a vast amount of data has to be transferred there. All the balances on the receivables ledger, all the outstanding invoices have to be transferred properly. And there's a lot that can go wrong with this conversion. You install the machine and the system, uh, and then there's going to be a changeover. Changeover is essentially, we should actually, by the way, put in here some training, train people on a new system before they actually have to use it. Uh, I will see methods of changeover, but basically it's where you wave goodbye to the old system, you welcome in the new system, and you hope it all works. And then after maybe a few months when it's all settled down and people are confident with it, you review it and you begin to go around this system again because people will have all sorts of requests uh, or they find something doesn't work very well or takes 
a little bit too long or is awkward I'd like a bit of different information on the screen we should be looking here ultimately if we are happy with the software uh, we should be happy with what it does its functionality we need to be happy with its reliability that it doesn't keep crashing and going down uh, that it has to be reasonably user-friendly uh, handy to use helpful to use menus which are don't take too many clicks to get through to what you do maybe with shortcut keys and so on pretty self-explanatory uh, response times uh, that you get the answer back within a couple of seconds if you're on the phone to somebody and they're answering you're asking a, they're asking about do you have inventory they're not going to wait a minute until you get the answer and expandability most of the businesses hope to expand they might be at one branch in the UK at the moment but maybe in five years they're going to be having branches in Europe so we need to deal with euros as well as sterling maybe they're thinking of having branches in America so now we've got three currencies involved instead of one branch we have maybe six branches we have to maybe be able to consolidate the results and so on if the software is not expandable it means you kind of have to go through an awful lot of this process again at great expense and potential disruption the testing uh, which we have and the training and the changeover uh, here logic testing program testing system testing user acceptance testing is usually what's happening uh, here so let's look at uh, logic testing uh, let's say that someone gets uh, overtime once they've done at least 40 hours there's going to be some sort of line in the program you know if hours greater than 40 then and there'll be some sort of calculation out here saying what their overtime is going to be just one line of the program but we have to make sure it functions correctly should it be over 40 or should it be over 41 maybe someone's mistyped it maybe they put in over 60 or something so logic testing is down to a very very detailed level of testing and that's just one part of the salaries program then what you want to do is to make sure that the salaries program the wages program yes it will take in the timesheets yes it will work out the number of hours somebody's worked uh, yes it will work out the pay depending whether it's over or under 40 hours yes it will calculate the tax correctly yes it will print out the payroll slip properly uh, and then the payroll system might be just part of a larger account system we have to look at a whole system accounting receivables payables cash book and so on to make sure it all kind of hangs together and this is really where we are finally i suppose being able to test the system uh, really from a, a user's point of view almost how long does it take now that we're using the proper system uh, is it handy to use is it quick enough to use and so on not too many very kind of baroque menus and so on uh, is it reliable if I put something silly in will it fall over or will it simply reject it or, or, or you know keep keep going and then we should have user acceptance do they find it is usable uh, it's not up really up to the the programmer to say it's usable it's open to hope the people use it every day are they happy with the screen layouts etc 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 and that's what we need you got to train people have to train people before the changeover takes place and then the changeovers there are potentially four different ways of changing over the first is direct but remember d equals dangerous uh, d uh, uh, is, is probably meaning disaster as well in a um, extreme situation it would mean uh, kind of turning off and almost throwing away the old system on a Friday night coming in turning on the new system on the Monday morning uh, uh, believing everything's going to work correctly of course if it doesn't work correctly depending on this sort of business you could be in real trouble you'd only do that in very very specialist circumstances where you could afford not to have the computer working for a number of days or even weeks or at least you could go back to the old one 
you hadn't actually thrown it out. Many people try a parallel run here. This is where you keep the old plot sinew going. Maybe for a couple of months. So you've always got your, your, your kind of fallback position going. The old system is still there. You can also compare the new results to the old results. At least some of the figures should be the same in that. And if the, the new one doesn't work, you can say you fall back. The downside is you, you, you're kind of increasing the work that people have to do. They have to process to the old system and they have to process again to the new system. So, so generally this isn't going to be happening for too long. A pilot operation, very useful. You have a number of shops, let's say. You're thinking of putting in a new kind of sales system or inventory system. You're not completely convinced maybe from the feasibility study that it's worthwhile. So you say, right, I'll do one shop only. I will put the system into one shop. I will get it working absolutely correctly there to complete satisfaction. The people in that shop will gain experience and expertise. Uh, and then, assuming we're happy with it, we can almost painlessly extend that to the other shops or the other branches. Phased operation is uh, where maybe what you do is you put in the receivables in one month, a bit of disruption in the receivables that section of accounts. And then maybe another month you do the payables. Then a third month maybe you do wages and salaries. It means that you haven't disrupted the whole accounting system uh, at once, uh, that you uh, can keep you know, more control over it. If something doesn't work well, then maybe the damage is going to be isolated in that particular section. Choosing software, sometimes people, instead of uh, writing their own software, they go out and they buy package uh, software. Uh, package software has a lot of advantages uh, to it. Let me just see if we have it here. Yep, we'll look at this slide first. It's uh, usually cheaper because development is spread very, very widely, uh, paid for by many customers. It's instantly available off the shelf, is another word for package software. Tends to be reliable, provided it's been out on the market for a few months. They've got you know, release 1.04 or something. Good support and good updates, uh, because the software house, as part of their marketing, will, will, will sell this. Uh, and support, maybe one person in the software house can support maybe 50 users. Uh, whereas if it is just bespoke software for you, then this person who's providing the support is kind of only working for you. It's going to be very expensive. The downside is it's a kind of strategic downside here. If you buy package software and all your competitors have bought the same package software, then this is going to constrain or govern pretty much what you're going to be able to do for your customers. You will not be able to do something which the software doesn't allow you to do. You'll not be able to maybe uh, bolt on that new service, which could have been uh, something useful to actually you know, attract new customers to you. So it might not perform exactly as you require uh, and will not necessarily differentiate you from other competitors. Uh, and some people really bite the bullet here. They're going to spend a lot of money developing special software which allows them to provide this extremely good service. If you're choosing software, you need to make sure the software house is financially stable. You don't want to buy software and then the software house to go out of business. You're left with a piece of software that can't even be updated for tax changes. Are they big enough to deal with us if we're having branches all over the world? A small local software house may not be able to, to, to service us, to train us. Uh, to repair the uh, problems that may crop up all over the world. Proper expertise, proper reputation for the sort of business we're in. Many software houses specialize, maybe specialize in software for pharmacies, of software for hotels, uh, and, and so on. And again, really industry knowledge about that, which is extremely useful. Sometimes you might want the uh, offices to be in your own country, otherwise you're going to have to be flying people in. There's a delay and a cost in doing that. Uh, and you need to look at other clients. Uh, if the software house sells to uh, competitors of yours, there could be 
a potential conflict of interest which is available there. Other items when choosing the software, make sure it does what you want, it's reliable, it's quick enough, it's compatible with uh, existing hardware and software systems, it is expandable, it will grow with you, it's easy enough to use, uh, it's updatable, uh, that's getting rather technical, uh, it, but properly written software is, so is safe to update, uh, whereas badly written software can be very dangerous to update. And of course the cost. How much is it uh, costing you to buy outright? And then usually there's going to be a, a yearly maintenance uh, cost associated with that as well. IS and IT strategy. All I'm going to say here is we've kind of got down to, to looking at you know, software development. We've looked at buying software and, and so on. Uh, but it's important to, to realize that the sort of software you use and what it is going to be doing for you can very much be a long-term decision. Uh, you have to kind of see maybe the way your industry is development, developing. So if you're in the publishing industry, uh, you will be seeing that maybe e-books are becoming very popular. And maybe what we need is to have an in-house facility for developing e-books as well as print books. You need to think uh, again maybe if you are making films, uh, we need to make sure that uh, our ISIT strategy uh, is capable of kind of going to a kind of Netflix direction where maybe we can host the films and people can download them or pay for them, rent them if you like, on the internet. These are long-term sorts of decisions, what the direction to go in, rather than should I buy that package or that package. It's very uh, critical often to the success and survival of the company uh, and can be key to getting competitive advantage. It will change all sorts of things here, the way products are made and sold, uh, how we communicate, what sort of information we're going to be collecting, uh, from our customers. It affects many, many layers within the company. It should uh, follow uh, here our strategic planning. So if your strategic plan says you want to open internationally, you need software which is capable of doing that. If your strategic planning is saying I'm going to outsource lots and lots of activities, maybe outsource even lots of the construction activities, then you need software which is capable of handling many outsourced contracts and making sure that all the parts are received in a kind of controlled way and that the timing is, is correct. You may, uh, for this, uh, set up some critical success factors. What makes us successful as a company? Uh, and you may uh, then say, how are we going to assess these here and quite often people say it's going to be these smart indicators. Uh, you are going to have very specific measures like maybe how quickly we can get parts from a supplier once we order it. Uh, we have to measure it. We have to see is it achievable? Is it possible for that company to supply us parts within the required time? Will the software support that? Uh, is the measure uh, relevant to us? Is it important that we measure how quickly the part comes or how quickly the software is going to uh, respond? And uh, we need to get this achieved within a certain time. A couple of extra slides to do now, final slides here. First of all, we've kind of uh, mentioned this in the opening uh, a little bit just to recognize that people at different levels in an organization have got different needs uh, for information, different sorts of information. At the high board level here, uh, they will be interested in their executive information systems. The data tends to be highly summarized, maybe dealing with the nine nearest million. It tends to be very forward-looking, estimates, budgets, etc. Uh, the uh, forward-looking information Ad hoc means non-routine. 
So the CEO has seen some program on television or read The Economist, uh, has been reading about the economy in Brazil, suddenly comes in on Monday morning and says, tell me about Brazil, what sort of market is it there, what sort of competitors are handy to decide whether we need to open there. And a lot of external information, looking at competition, looking at technology, looking at economics and so on, as well as the internal. Right down at the bottom of the organization, we're really onto the transaction processing here, through the debits and credits. There the information has to be very accurate, really to the last cent. Detailed, historical information, we tend to be recording transactions which already happened, almost exclusively internal and very routine. Every week you do the wages, every week you do the receivables run or something of that type. And then kind of trapped in the middle here, we have the middle management, tend to be dealing with management information systems and decision support systems. If you're going to be looking for what are the qualities of good data, uh, you can look at uh, this, if this, as you see, spells accurate going down here. Information should be sufficiently accurate to be useful. It needs to be complete. It needs to be cost beneficial. That came out in the feasibility study. There's no point in having information where the benefit is less than the cost. It has to be understandable and user targeted. You don't want, um, in a way, too much information that's going to overburden you. It has to be relevant. In other words, it has to be relevant to your position. You've given me this information. What am I supposed to do with it? What sort of decisions am I, or action am I supposed to take on it? It has to be authoritative, and I would say beware there of believing anything on the internet. Yeah, you don't necessarily know what sort of uh, sites information is coming from. They, they claim certain statistics or certain events, but you may have no real reason to believe them. It has to come quickly enough. Uh, there's a, a big problem in slow information that arrives after you've made a decision which really demanded that information and it has to be relatively easy to use. And finally, uh, we'll just mention big data. Big data, extremely large collections of data that can be analyzed to reveal patterns, trends, and associations, uh, particularly looking at human behavior, consumer behavior, and interactions. It's the sort of data which is typically collected by uh, supermarkets uh, or mobile phone companies or many of the companies that you browse on the internet. Remember, every page you browse on the internet, uh, the probably the internet service provider, but certainly the website owner, knows where you've been. They know exactly what pages you've looked at they know what products you've expressed an interest in, uh, and they're trying to use that data really to increase their sales. The characteristics of big uh, data, huge variety. So if you were to go into a supermarket, uh, uh, obviously uh, they can record what you buy. You have a loyalty card, which you swipe through, uh, and that will record against your name, your purchases, and hang on to that maybe for five years. So they've got that sort of numerical or financial information. They know when you tend to shop. Is it Saturday mornings? Is it Thursday evenings? Etc. Uh, obviously they can building up um, information about your kind of purchasing habits. Uh, but also what they can now begin to do if they know your mobile phone number, it's possible for them as you go around the supermarket with your mobile phone on, they can track you going around the supermarket and they know that yes you have paws in front of yogurts or you have paws in front of cream cakes or whatever it is and if you pause there even if you don't buy they might deduce that you have an interest in yogurts or cream cakes whatever it is uh, and what they can then do is maybe tempt you by uh, through email or even through a text message uh, sending you information maybe about a discount so there's kind of geographical information in there. And then what they're beginning to do is they know who you are because of your mobile phone signal 
Uh, and then of course there are cameras in the ceiling, they will recognize you, they will do facial recognition uh, work on you. Uh, and now wherever you go in the supermarket, with or without your mobile phone, they kind of know who you are and know your shopping habits and know your preferences. So we have here financial data, uh, we have kind of got geographical data, where you've been in, in the shop, uh, we have your mobile phone number, uh, and it could maybe even track it other places. And it has, of course, information about what you look at, look like. So maybe if you go into any shop anywhere uh, belonging to that supermarket, they will be able to recognize you. The data arises very quickly, arrives very quickly, continually, really. We have to be able to cope with that, V, the, the velocity. And huge volumes, huge, huge volumes of data comes in. Indeed, many of the, the big companies like Google and like Facebook, which, which also are big custodians of uh, big data, are putting their uh, computer systems uh, in places like Alaska or Norway, uh, where the weather is cold uh, and where it is much easier to keep the computer systems cool, much more environmentally friendly. And of course, there is veracity here. Uh, big data is all very well to, to collect it, uh, but are we making the right deductions from it? Have we identified you accurately? Is the data believable? So here we are, we'll just look at a couple of these here. Uh, retailers, loyalty cards uh, coming in there. We have social media, mobile phone companies, where you know where you've been and so on there. Internet service providers and uh, websites know exactly where you visited and, and so on. Banking systems, they can analyze your credit cards. Again, they know the sort of purchases you, you make. They can build up quite a comprehensive picture of you and your lifestyle and your shopping. So we looked, I think, at the variety there. Analytics, so they collect, why are they, why are they collecting this information? Well, it's, it's to analyze it. Uh, you can uh, go through the data looking for patterns and relationships. You're maybe trying to predict somebody buying something or to predict expenditure which is going on there. So out of data mining can come predictive analytics. Uh, but one of the uh, examples as we've got in, in here, uh, if you have a points card for flights and you maybe have occasionally uh, upgraded yourself at some point, they know that this person quite likes an upgrade. Uh, and maybe if we, when they booked kind of economy, then we dangle a special upgrade in front of them. Maybe they'll pay, you know, the extra 30 pounds to, to get the upgrade or something uh, of that sort. Text analytics, uh, you can text uh, somebody, but the mobile phone company can analyze it, can read it. You put in uh, uh, emails, uh, the email company can, can read it as well and look out maybe for, for key words. Voice analytics uh, can happen on phone calls. There are of course legal impediments maybe to some of this, but it's perfectly feasible and certainly used by security services to uh, uh, listen out for, if you like, key names or key words. And then statistical analytics, an interesting example of statistical analytics comes from Google uh, Google uh, has been able to predict um, epidemics of diseases, let's say flu, uh, before it was picked up by the authorities. Because if, uh, let's say, people begin getting flu in a particular town, then more people go to Google and put in flu, or flu symptoms, or flu cures, or whatever they're going to be doing, and Google picks that up. They say, oh gosh, uh, in Bristol, uh, a lot of people are suddenly started Googling flu, uh, we reckon there's an epidemic of flu going on in Bristol. This is even before people have visited the doctors or visited the pharmacies that they've done it at home. Uh, and then they can kind of almost trace these uh, epidemics as they, they go through the, the country. It's very powerful indeed, big data. Uh, the, 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 the detail of the analysis which can come out is really quite remarkable. The risks that we have of big data, it can cost a heck of a lot and maybe you won't get any return. There is regulation, uh, a 
authorities, laws and so on, uh, are worried about uh, people's privacy being invaded, so you have to make sure that you don't fall foul of any compliance issues and suffer compliance risk. Loss and theft of the data, uh, it seems almost every month uh, another large company has been hacked into. Uh, Amazon, for example, lost a lot of uh, customer information. Uh, and then, of course, once you've lost the customer information, you may have lost customer confidence. Uh, and then maybe somebody uses a credit card number to defraud your customer. What's your responsibility there? Is the data accurate? Uh, and then finally, it's been used sometimes for employee monitoring. Uh, you have employees with a kind of name badge on, but it's got a little transmitter. You can monitor customer, monitor employees as they move through the premises. You can monitor what other employees they talk to. Uh, you can even monitor what they're saying constantly. Uh, and uh, there are, of course, maybe some legitimate reasons for doing this, but of course it's, it's prone to very, very great invasions of privacy uh, for employees.